Now to introduce our speakers, um, Mr. Kramer brings us the unique perspective of a lifetime of Cold War study and government service. Born in England and educated at Harvard and the University of California, Berkeley, he was a civil servant in eight presidential administrations. With six presidents from John F. Kennedy to George W. Bush, with two secretaries of defense, Robert McNamara and Donald Rumsfeld, and with two senior members of Congress, Congressman Jack Kemp and Senator John Tower. With President Nixon, Mr. Kramer served on the National Security Council staff from the President's inauguration to his res resignation. He also has the unique perspective of working on the NSA for an unparalleled nine-year period with President Nixon's predecessor, Lyndon B. Johnson, and his successor, Gerald Ford, and later working as Ronald Reagan's NSC Director of Arms Control for seven more years that transformed U.S. Cold War strategy and were decisive in achieving a peaceful end to the Cold War. Today, Mr. Kramer will draw upon his perspective on a graduate seminar he taught for over a decade on U.S. national security, emerging threats, and arms control, and on Mr. Kramer's recent book, uh, Inside the Cold War, From Marx to Reagan, which he'll be happy to sign after uh, the program, and they are available for purchase in the museum store. The book is an unpre unprecedented guide to the ideological roots, historic turning points, strategies, and key official documents on the Cold War. On detente policy, Mr. Kramer is often quite critical, but former U.S. officials with a range of policy views like Henry Kissinger, Donald Rumsfeld, a pioneering analysis, a new milestone, indispensable, and having authoritative documentation and unique insights. Mr. Kramer is a distinguished fellow in national security affairs at Washington's American Foreign Policy Council in Washington, D.C. He is joined here today by his Chilean-born wife, a former concert pianist, and the founding director of a Washington, D.C. performing arts company that produces opera and cabaret. Their two sons, one of them here today, uh, are also active in music, uh, theater, and writing. Welcome. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Luke Nichter as our moderator today. As I mentioned earlier, he's a professor of, uh, of history at Texas A&M University, Central Texas, and he's published two revealing books on Richard Nixon's presidency. Uh, he's talked here at this podium um, several times uh, about his books and his uh, expertise on the Nixon tapes, uh, which uh, a book that he's co-authored with um, Douglas, historian Douglas Brinkley. And he'll return on, uh, to the Nixon Library on October 23rd to discuss his recent book, Richard Nixon and Europe, the reshaping of the post-Atlantic post -Atlantic world. Uh, Dr. Nichter and Mr. Kramer, the, the stage is yours. Well, everyone, uh, I, I think a, a, a perfectly good place to start here, I think, is a reminder through the introduction just how unusual an event of this kind is. Uh, you, you have someone who, if you, if you think about the number of administrations that he served in, either in the Pentagon or in the White House proper, and you have Kennedy, you have Johnson, you have Nixon, you have Ford. A botched retirement after that, back for Reagan another botched retirement, and back for Bush 43, or the administration of George W. Bush. And to have someone like this, it really is unique, because people who work in this capacity are surrounded by secrecy during their career. They're trained not to talk about their work. Uh, they're trained not to give uh, unauthorized disclosures. And so here you have an authorized disclosure tonight. Uh, you have an evening with someone who spent, who's observed government and spent 50 years in it uh, in a bipartisan fashion, uh, also rare these days. Uh, and uh, it's our chance to spend an evening with him and to learn from him. Uh, the basis from the book, but uh, going beyond the book. So I think from there, before we dive into the substance, let's talk about your background a little bit. Because I, I've emphasized how unique the evening is in your career.
but you really do bring a unique mix of government service, war experience, uh, personal study of history yourself, and policy insights to even today's discussions. These are points relevant not just for the 1960s or 70s, but for today in many cases. You experienced war directly yourself as a, as a child in World War II and later in Vietnam. Uh, you immigrated to America and studied, as, as was said, at Harvard and, and at Berkeley, two of our finest institutions in the nation. You served in the US, US government over a nearly 50 year period, including at the National Security Council with four presidents at the Pentagon and with Congress. And your book, Inside the Cold War from Marx to Reagan, has a unique historical scope and documentation. So by way of background, how does all this experience uh, shape your perspective and lessons, since we're here in the Nixon Library, on Nixon and detente? Thank you, Luke. And thank you very much, President Barabal, to the uh, foundation here, and for John uh, Mavridis, who introduced us. It is indeed very rare that I've ever spoken about anything I've done in the government. Uh, but I taught a course, a seminar, a graduate, and have worked these issues actually since uh, my days at Andover, prep school I went to before I went to Harvard. I studied in Harvard about history and the Cold War and ideologies and philosophies that lead to dictatorships, to totalitarian ideologies, and to warfare between democracies and totalitarians. And that's what the Cold War was about. It was about what I have on the front cover of my book, which is the Statue of Liberty, which is the first building structure that I saw on a boat coming from the dark continent, the war continent of Europe, where I spent the Second World War, mostly in a German cellar. I'm British by birth. My mother, who's Swedish, and I were captured by the Gestapo, the secret police, and held. My father got out and made it to America, became a citizen and a soldier, and came back to Germany, was allowed to fight the Germans instead of the Japanese, which is what the intelligence people wanted, because his parents and his wife and child were there. And I learned, therefore, firsthand, the first Americans I encountered were bombing the hell out of my area. And the next ones found me and liberated me. And so when I came to America, I was nine years old. I was learning English, and that was the first object that I saw. And everybody on the ship was in tears. So it was easy for me always to want to study issues of war and peace, and how very difficult that is to maintain peace, to get to peace, if there's an ideology against you that promotes war, civil war at home, an imperial or colonialist or expansionist war abroad. And that's why I've studied that issue and lived it and experienced it. And when I was, um, this, this is history, by the way, that is not taught anymore. It's not known, it's ignored, and in cases like Putin's Russia, it's completely suppressed. Uh, as you know, he, he has said that the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union, which means that they lost the Cold War. And their ideology of communism crumbled. So I believe that it is very important in the current age still to remember what, was, what has happened before, and especially what strategies were attempted in, in order to try to calm down totalitarians and their weapons, their weapons of belief and their weapons of torture and of war. And so I would, I would just as soon be talking about Korea or Iran or Russia or Pakistan or uh, places that, that, and China at times, that collaborate still in trying to tear down democracy and in building those forces of intolerance and of war. My view of Nixon President Nixon was shaped when I was in college and when I took my civil service exams, um, he had just, which was in 1962, and entered the uh, Kennedy administration. He was, uh, he was still famous as the vice president. He was famous as having 
uh, lost the election against Jack Kennedy, who was treated as a hero, and whose personal flaws, which were considerable, were forgiven because he was so eloquent and elegant. Uh, and then I knew that he had participated in the anti-communist uh, hearings in Washington, uh, including of an uh, industry famous in this area, the movie industry. And he had been a seaman before that in the Navy. And he was a lawyer, and then he ran for governor, which had, when I was at Berkeley, he ran for governor. And just the name of Governor Nixon made people laugh. He was at a place like that attacked just by definition. Um, when I entered the government, and that is still my vocation and my calling, I use the word calling and vocation in a religious sense, you have to look for what calls you to action, what, passion, what passions get you to working, and to take responsibility. The word responsibility means you're responding to a call. My call was to public service, and possibly to teaching, which I've done, and to try to work on this issue of how do democracies maintain their democracy, both against internal and external temptations and threats. And so I'm very glad to give you some more thoughts as we go along. Well, as you share these insights from your background, let's move up before, the, the period before Richard Nixon. And tell us a little bit more of, give us a little more of your ideological background in terms of, why, and why was ideology important anyways? Uh, it, it came, your, your ideology came from uh, your experience during the Second World War, uh, the, the Cold War, and, but one thing I notice in your book is that you place, the, really, you argue in your book the beginning of the Cold War really was not something that started in the 1940s, which is the popular understanding. But you go much further back. You go back to really founding uh, ideologies of the Cold War uh, even much earlier in the 20th century. So talk a little bit about those ideological roots. Well, the Chinese uh, strategist Sun Tzu said about strategy, know yourself and know your enemy. Uh, that's what the Cold War was about, and part of knowing your enemy in the Cold War, and that was between two, led by two superpowers, or two large powers, the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, both came from strong faiths. In the case of the American freedom faith, my first chapter of my book is about that, the founding documents, in inalienable rights, cre creator, given by the creator, not by a state by God, they're, they're, they're untouchable. Now we learned in the American experience to expand that understanding of unalienable for every man and woman. It took a while, it took a civil war among other things, it took the civil rights movement. And I would remind you that when Martin Luther King spoke in Washington, and I was in Washington when he spoke in March of 1963, he didn't say I have a dream. He said I still have a dream. And then the cascading words say I have a dream about judging people not by their color, and so on. And he would have added, if he had known Marxist-Leninist vocabulary, which he knew but it disdained, dis disliked, he would have said, not, not their class, not their background, but their value by, as, a, as a creature of God, as in the image, and as an American entitled to that, being treated that way. Um, so the, my second chapter of my book is about Marxism-Leninism. Marx treated himself as an empiricist, social scientist. He wasn't. He was a prophet. Much of his rambling, really, to me, was, and I studied it, I taught it at Berkeley, to people who thought they were on the far left and thought they might be Marxists, but had never read what he'd actually written. And so they didn't know that his treatment of history was based on something called dialectical materialism, which is, a, as he said, turned Hegel upside down, the German philosopher. Man is only material. There is no soul, there is no individuality, there is no God. It's a collective, malleable group of atoms. You can rearrange it, and guess how we can rearrange it? Form a perfect template of a new society, which would, he would say would, it might be a state, but the state would wither away. That's what he kind of argued, and Lenin argued his successor because there would be a perfect administration by the society being in charge of distribution, of production and 
institution of all wealth. There would be no private property, there would be no private families. It, there was no such thing as private rights. It would be collective, collective. He said there would be a socialist stage to a communist society. And he attacked people who were democratic socialists who said you don't need a dictatorship of the proletariat. He attacked, in, not just in the manifesto, those who wanted peaceful transitions to that. He would have, he would have put probably Bernie Sanders in jail the first day he met him. Uh, there would be no independent trade unions, labor unions. There would be no competitive parties. There'd be a vanguard, which in Lenin's terms would be a single party that was the elite that controlled, administered, planned, punished anything, any deviation from the central plan and central ownership, which was, after all, a state. So when you were, if you were a socialist or communist in that tradition, you wanted to centralize, centralize everything and forbid anything that was different from what the uh, planners would, on a scientific basis, propose. In that sense, the prophet, the prof prophecy of a wonderful society with all contradictions eliminated, classes eliminated, and the traditional class warfare from feudal to industrial, all these stages would be overcome. And uh, why do you have competitive parties or competitive philosophies? By the way, it involved the abol abolition of uh, all religion because that was a, religion was simply an opiate of the ruling class. And if you came to power by violence, or as you came to power, you had to crush the other classes, the enemy classes, the remnants of the class you were killing off. So the choice given to those that this, this vanguard encountered were either convert or go to prison or die. Where have you heard that offer before or recently? You, you can get, in some areas of this world, you can get decapitated if you don't convert or confess or die. I mean, uh, or or, or you, can, you can be really killed for it. So I see the roots of what then next happened in the French Revolution, where the goddess reason was put into Notre Dame Cathedral scientific. It ended with a guillotine. Uh, it ended with an emperor who went to war on Russia. It ended with a very uncivilized approach to modern life. And incidentally, Lafayette, who, the Frenchman who fought with us, was not welcome in his own country after the French Revolution, which took place about the same year, 1789, as our Constitution was signed. Then comes Marxism-Leninism in the 1849 Manifesto and later and the 1917 coup, not revolution, by Lenin, not against the Tsar, but against the March Revolution, which was a coalition government led by Mr. Kerensky, a democratic socialist, who was leading a coalition of parties towards a democratic reform and transition. Lenin hated that, killed off those people in a coup, almost bloodless, in October of uh, 1917, he immediately made peace with the invading German imperial troops who were a thousand miles, a thousand kilometers inside Russia. He undercut badly the French and British and Americans fighting in France against the German imperial troops. He enabled, therefore, one million of them to cross with their equipment over into France. And if they had gotten there, a little bit earlier, before the Americans arrived in large numbers in April of 1917, guess who would have won the European war? The Germans. So that's Lenin's first big betrayal of the foreign powers. He, he certainly waged war on what he said were the capitalists in the West. Uh, he also, of course, betrayed the hopes for bread and peace and land that the Russians had, the Russian population. He set up the uh, Cheka, the Gestapo type the secret police, he had big purges, he collectivized farms, and by the time Lenin was dead and Stalin took over, five million Ukrainians lost their lives in the Holomodor, as they call it, version of the word Holocaust, um, in, in the 30s. Uh, 
In the mid-30s, Mr. Roosevelt, our president, decided to make peace. That means diplomatically recognize the Soviet government. They promised him all kinds of things, civil rights at home and non-interference abroad. Instead, they violated both of those tenets of hope. And uh, they, the most cruel thing they did, and to me personally rather fateful, was the Hitler-Stalin Pact, a taboo subject today, where the German Hitler's National Socialist, I'll tell you the words in German. Die National, die Nationalistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, Sozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. National, Nazi onal means Nazi. When Antifa calls people Nazis, they don't realize that Hitler, like his predecessor as a dictator in Europe, Mussolini, were former socialists, defended things they called workers' parties, spoke for the workers against the plutocrats, the wealthy, the property owners, the bankers, the latter category often, and the media people often identified with Jews. Marx himself a Jew was anti-Semitic. Capitalists were Jews, often. Hitler did the same some years later. They both had killing fields at home. They both had imperial ambitions abroad to spread the, their uh, ideology. They killed right and left. And the overlap of the far left and the far right, which is, should be obvious to anybody, is simply not tolerated in, in common discussion. You have to realize that when Hitler and Stalin made this pact in 1939, on August 23rd, my father having gotten out some time before, my mother's passport Swedish, mine child English, we were enemies. And we had to stay. It, this, hit, Stalin was on the wrong side for 21 months. He didn't change sides from helping Hitler. They both invaded Poland at the same time. They did other things until uh, Hitler invaded him. And then he had purged so many of his soldiers and had so little prepared for war that uh, the Germans made very rapid advances, which we, the United States of America, saved. We saved the forces in the Far East from Japan, which was in the Axis Pact with the Germans, and for a while, and the Italians, and for a while, actually, the Soviets were, in a, were the fourth member of, a, in effect, a pact against democracy, against the democracies, against human rights. Um, we saved Russia from the success of the German invasion, first through massive land lease, 50,000 airplanes, tens of thousands of tanks, et cetera, et cetera. We f took on the Japanese, which the Russians didn't until the last, last days of the war. Uh, we saved Siberia. We saved by attacking in Normandy and in Africa, or the areas where the Russians were absent. The Russians fought bravely, the Russian people. But they would have not been able to hold the Eastern Front if Japan had gone in there, which we were deterring. By the way, we saved China, too. When I meet Chinese officials who berate me or my country, not me, but they don't know what my views are particularly, uh, I say, you know, we saved you. We saved you. You'd be speaking Japanese if we hadn't gone in there and fought. And you Russians would be speaking German. <laughs> so we've done well. We have sometimes made bad mistakes, but we've also done well. So that's part of my background for what then happened in what's known as the Cold War uh, between Harry Truman and, and Mr. Roosevelt, because we were allies in that war. We both fought bravely. I think our power, and I think our power includes a very strong element of moral power. I'm not talking just military. There are ac academics today who waste a lot of time saying, are you an idealist or a realist? Well, you, of course, you can't be either one without the other. So moral power, moral suasion, moral legitimacy makes a huge difference. And maybe we can address that. 
in other questions? Well, with all of these events and background uh, from World War I and World War II, the rise of totalitarianism that you've covered here, as we move kind of closer to through the Cold War and into the Nixon period, you know, why, what was the importance, the significance of these events that you've talked about and, and how are they so important in shaping Cold War strategies sort of leading up to the Nixon administration? Okay, the main things that Mr. Truman and then and Stalin and their successors worked on in the, as the relationship, the tensions grew very great after the end of the Second World War and we formed, we had formed a successful alliance for about four years. I say the Russians entered it rather late. They fought very well for their own country. Remember Stalin's message on socialism and on communism was one country first, that country's the Soviet Union. Everybody else who adopts this and whom we help, which they, and they gave enormous help to the Chinese revolutionaries on the left, was the priority was always Russia, Soviet Russia. And as the Red Army moved into Eastern Europe by the design of the Yalta and Potsdam conferences of the Allies, they, they, were, they were occupiers. And among the people they liquidated in the Baltics, in Poland, in areas that had been occupied by the Germans, were those who had been in the resistance against the Germans. The Polish Home Army, which had got, was fighting with the British very heroically in places like Italy, but also on the Eastern Front at times, were liquidated because they had made the mistake of being democratic versions of socialism and they were not communists. And they just used their power to liquidate. I remember as a kid reading about the coup in Czechoslovakia in 1968, in 1950, I'm sorry, 48. I remember as a freshman at Harvard, I think there was only one person in the entire faculty that spoke out against the Soviet suppression with tanks of the Hungarian Revolution and of the Polish October, which was a parallel revolution. That man was Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was one of my faculty members, and later on he was Mr. Carter's uh, security advisor. We, we didn't quite understand the uprising in East Germany in 1953, the Polish and Hungarian revolutions. The tanks just came in and crushed them. In 1968, the Soviets did that in Czechoslovakia. And we had a policy that was developed in the, by George Kennan and Paul Nitze and under Harry Truman's watch in 1950. And it was stimulated by the Korean War, which was North, North Korea invaded South Korea, aided by the Soviets, who have aided them ever since, protected them. Uh, and that, that policy was called containment. We didn't contain. The, the Soviet empire and its influence expanded into the third world. The Chinese revolution of uh, October 1st, 1949 took over large areas there in China and in the neighborhood. They were very active in Vietnam. They were very active in, in other places. The third world was, became a com, com, um, combative ground for them. And so containment, didn't let the salami tactics, the often deception, active measures, penetration of the Soviet agents and military, uh, didn't deter them. So then we developed this theory of massive retaliation and mutual assured destruction. We means Mac, uh, Robert Strange McNamara, I sometimes called him Robert Extremely Strange McNamara. He was the first senior boss I had in the civil service. And they believed that threatening atomic weapons at a massive level, mutual suicide level, would deter somebody. What it really did, in my opinion, was A, it was more, to me, that was morally questionable. But B, if the president had the choice between massive retaliation with a nuclear weapon or doing nothing to, to force back the aggressor moving forward, well, guess what he did? Nothing. Now, the rhetoric of an Eisenhower or John Foster Dulles, very aggressive, we'll do this and that, and freedom and freedom, no, I mean, it, it wasn't effective. When the Cubans moved into the Caribbean area, we didn't 
that was our basic policy? No, we fact that it was not. I mean, what, what, what could you do? And unfortunately, mutual assured destruction and was combined with a view that you could not have anti-missile defenses because that would somehow provoke the other guy, the bad guy, to, to think that you were launching a first strike against him and so on. So when we discuss now, I think we probably would move to the Nixon strategy of detente. It made a real serious effort, I think a moral, morally extremely well-intentioned effort to break through this cycle of violence and to reach real understanding and we'll, maybe can, we can discuss why not, why that didn't work so well. Well, I think that sets us up well as we get into the Nixon years. And your career and your work during the Nixon years intersects with the three principal foreign policy issues of the Nixon administration. I mean, first, it was U.S.-Soviet detente and the talks over arms and arms control. And secondly, it was Sino-U.S. relations and the, the beginning of opening relations between the United States and China after more than 20 years of non-contact during the Cold War. And then third, Vietnam. And so kind of taking each one of those, since you spent part of your career working on all three of these, I, I guess the first question is sort of what was detente? We have people, you know, I, I always remember, I teach primarily 18 to 20 year olds in the classroom. And I always try to remember what they know. And sometimes it isn't very much, and sometimes it surprises you. But for 18 to 20 year olds, you know, the Cold War is, it might as well be the Civil War, and, and Richard Nixon might as well be Abraham Lincoln, or something so far in our past that it couldn't possibly have any relevance to, our, to our, our era today. So I think the first question is sort of uh, what was detente, and why were you, I uh, say, a, a constructive critic of the policy? Well, the 1968 election, which brought Richard Nixon to power, was at a time of extreme crisis in domestically and huge threats abroad developing and, and, and bogged down U.S. forces in Vietnam. The violence at home, anybody who thinks that the current tensions in the United States are severe, which they, there are some, and there are some factions that are just violent by nature and attack anybody who disagrees with them. And often wear masks in that process, which is not very courageous. And they look like sort of Darth Vader's almost. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, black uniforms, by the way, were worn by Italian fascists, Mussolini's people with black shirts, black. Uh, the SS in Germany, of German National Socialism, were, were black. It's also the color of anarchism. It also suggests death. The swastika, incidentally, was a, uh, in German, it's called Hakenkreuz, the hooked cross. It's a specifically pagan, anti-Christian, anti-religious symbol. Um, the hammer and sickle of the Soviets was also cut. These were cutting and smashing instruments. Um, the Red Star was red, that's on top of many buildings still in Moscow, and was in, is in the flags of the North Vietnamese, now the entire Vietnamese, and in the Korea, Korean flag, that Red Star is a bloody star. You've crushed the enemy. You have to crush the heretic. You have to crush the defilers of your own sacred texts and your own sacred sacraments and your own sacred pledges and so on. These are religions where the leader is a god. The Kim family of Korea has been around since 1949. The Castro's have been in charge for 60 years. Now they are no longer quite totalitarian and they're, they're gonna find out how long the Castro name lasts once things get a little freer there, travelers. Um, the Communist Party of China has not become more democratic the mystery of who is elected every 10 years to be the premier and re-elected every five years. Or so. It's a mystery. It makes the selection of the pope seem like a very open thing. And of course, these, par these powers do not we have to respond to parliaments where anybody can vote no, where many people do vote no, or where the prime minister falls when there's a 
majority, you lose the majority on a specific issue. So when Mr. Nixon came in, he faced these kind of ideologies and these symbols and the fight in Vietnam where we had 550,000 troops. He inherited that. He said, we can only solve this issue, resolve it peace, peacefully and over with uh, peace with honor, get our prisoners of war back. If the Soviet Union and the PRC, the People's Republic of China, watch out for anybody that calls himself a People's Republic. In German, that would have been Volksrepublik. Volk is the folk. It's the proletariat and the common people, the common peasant for whom you speak, the party. They're not peoples. They're not full republics. They are dictatorships. Maybe they're even totalitarian ones. Mr. Nixon said, I've got to get these two big powers, China and Russia, to agree to put pressure on their little North Vietnamese ally. Little, because they had hundreds of millions of population against few tens. And, but all the artillery, all the tanks, the aircraft, and the pilots came from Russia or from China in the Vietnam War. That was not a civil war only. It, uh, there were civil war aspects to it. These same forces were very active in Laos and in Cambodia. So Nixon, Mr. Nixon thought, let's get their help to understand that they have national interests and national strategies and views which could share some of our big power American concerns, and which, by the way, would help progress towards a real global new restructuring in, restructuring in the direction of peace. I, I believe totally that Mr. Nixon was a peace maker or speech, peace searcher. He really seemed to want it. Actually, I'm struck, I was struck during his presidency and I was there before he came in in the White House and I was there after he left, four and a half years, that he was actually quite sincere in that. It's, it was not a fake kind of thing. And you know, when you see his modest beginnings here and you know how tough it was for him to seem relaxed or to be relaxed and to be, in, I had only very rare encounters with him because I was low down on the totem pole. But he was gracious and he really thought that he and his, his senior colleague, Henry Kissinger, his, sec, his national security advisor and for a while his secretary of state, could reach into the minds and possibly into the hearts of these large powers rulers. And in Zhou Enlai, the premier who worked with uh, Mao, and in uh, the Russian leader, uh, Mr. Brezhnev, who was a little bit tougher, they thought, he thought they could make agreements for something called peaceful coexistence which was a Soviet propaganda line which they practiced in, throughout Europe with some considerable effect. We can exist peacefully, coexist. We don't have to go to war. But meanwhile, they were subverting, 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 deceiving, lying. They were cheating on every agreement they signed, as I believe they still are, they, the Russians, <laughs> the Russian government, because it hasn't changed much on that. But so the notion that you could sign an agreement, one could talk through the points of hot, the hot spots of conflict, calm them down, negotiate with very skillful diplomacy, which Mr. Nixon wanted and, and, and Dr. Kissinger thought he could do very well. They put real hope in these, in, in detoxifying the race. The word detente is from a French word that means, you know, when you, when you pull the bow and the arrow, if there's an arrow in there, it shoots aggressively forward. But if you, if you relax the pull and just let it go so it's no longer so taut, then that's detente. You have you detached somehow the power for moving forward aggressively from the situation. And that's, that's what they thought they could do. And so there were three big agreements, for example, on that at the summit year. But maybe hmm. you want to discuss those? Or? So while you're more of a, again, a critic or pessimistic about the body of agreements that became, that were known as detente, moving on to the other major, one of the other major issues uh, during the Nixon years while you uh, worked in the Nixon White House was Sino-U.S. relations. Uh, 
I think you've been and written and spoken you're more positive about the outcome of that, those negotiations, the agreements that were produced during those years. So while more critical on the actions with the Soviets, you're more positive with respect to China. Why, why is that? Well, well I, I, need to, I need to outline three of the agreements with the Russians to tell you the difference between those, which were almost tragic in my view. And, and the approach towards the Chinese, and the Chinese approach towards us. In the, in the case of the Russians, uh, in 1972, which was the high point of detente, uh, Richard Nixon and Leonid Brezhnev signed three agreements in Moscow in May, end of May and beginning of June of 1972. And there is a closely related Vietnam agreement that came about six months later in January of 73. And remember, this is in an election year. Nixon had barely won the 68 election uh, against um, his opponent, Hubert Humphrey, whom I knew well because I worked in the Johnson White House. And Hubert Humphrey is, was about as ebullient and uh, inspiring, in a way, politician as I've ever met, whereas Lyndon Johnson took the oxygen out of every room I was in with him <laughs> until he broke down. He broke down on March 31st. I thought it was very sad. After the Tet Offensive, which had, the North Vietnamese came in and they used the big national holiday in Vietnam to overrun a lot of areas. Um, Johnson uh, retired from the, from the race effect, in effect, and that opened up the Democratic Party to vicious, vigorous struggles be, between Bobby Kennedy and George McGovern and, and others. And Humphrey uh, won, had won the nomination, but he lost the election narrowly. And then that party just split and went pretty far to the left. So in 72, Richard Nixon encountered in November a very weakened Democratic Party, which had turned pretty far left. And many of those Humphrey Democrats were Scoop Jackson Democrats. And I knew many of them very well. I mean, as just as colleagues. Um, turned to Ronald Reagan a few years later. They became Reagan Democrats. Uh, but the three agreements that were signed, just quickly, you've got to watch what the time is, too. Because I, I could keep going on for hours. Uh, the, the, um, the first agreement was a strategic arms limitation agreement. And it was very controversial. I can't go through all of the aspects of it. but. Uh, it, it capped the arms race. It didn't have any reductions. So the Soviet and American submarine fleets, for example, strategic aren't armed, go up in large numbers. There was no real restriction on bombers. And the strategic missiles, the intercontinental ballistic missiles that you're now hearing that the Koreans, North Koreans have, were not really limited in their modernization capabilities, and the Russians used the word modernization to have an incredible number of new types immediately after they signed this agreement. Massive missiles with 10 warheads and, and so on and so on. That agreement was very strongly challenged by the Jackson Democrats, in a way by the Humphrey Democrats, and by harder line, maybe conservative, or you would call them uh, Republicans. And it didn't get very far beyond the signature. But an amendment, Jackson amendment to it, required that all future nuclear arms agreements have um, equal levels for the US and Soviet capabilities, which was not the case with SALT II, and that a robust research and development and modernization program be promised to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, because the Americans had fallen behind. The second agreement was the Anti-Ballistic Missile Defense Treaty, which I was one of the very few people, and I wasn't authorized to do so, but I disagreed with it <laughs> in the White House because I thought it was immoral. I thought it was immoral to ban anti-ballistic missile, missile programs. And these, the ones in that treaty were left to 200, and then it was reduced to 100 anti-ballistic missile defenses and limited radars and so on, and, and that was reduced to 100 on each side. Um, and 
it was to me like saying you cannot have fire hoses when there are arsonists around because the first time you use a fire hose, you discourage the artist, the, the arsonist. Or you, I mean, you leave people defenseless. And it, that was part of having bought into the mutual assured destruction strategy, reliance, which was Mr. McNamara's mathematical dream. It didn't have a, to me, it didn't have a moral resilience. And it was therefore also strategically. It was moral and strategically wrong. But Mr. Nixon's advisors were so used to that doctrine, and allegedly it saved money and it was more effective than having stronger conventional forces or uh, not necessarily relying on crossing the nuclear threshold, that it was just uh, accepted. It was accepted in the, in the Reagan period. It was rejected in, in the Strategic Defense Initiative, which I supported very strongly on moral and strategic grounds. But he couldn't get out of that treaty. The Soviets were violating it very badly with their programs, and we didn't get out of it until Mr. Bush in, in 2001 with Don Rumsfeld. OK, the third agreement was um, something called the Tan Principles Agreement. And there, the two sides signed the same text for peaceful coexistence, shared interests in solving specific problems. It never got around to implementing that. It didn't say much about human rights. It, it really, in my opinion, overlooked the notion that there was a difference between the totalitarian ideology and state in the Soviet Union and the US. But it was signed in order, A, because the Soviets wanted it, and it was connected to the hopes for peace in Vietnam and the pressure that was expected with some illusory hope, it turned out, from the Soviet Union. In that agreement, um, the Soviet leaders, Brezhnev, in the same month that he signed that agreement, said that, by the way, detente um, and the network of, of uh, the network of agreements did not mean that they would in any way reduce the support for revolutionary pro-communist, pro-Soviet. Uh, actions and states and so on. And it, of course, it meant that the so-called socialist camp, is which is how the Soviets always referred to their East European colonies or states, and to those that they fostered in Africa, in Angola, with Cuban help. You know, the Soviets brought 40,000 Cuban infantry to Angola and Mozambique and so on. That was around 75, so that was after this agreement was signed. But right after this agreement was signed, when the president left office and things collapsed around him, he, that broke the authority of the American presidency for some years. The Congress, which had turned, was turning quite radical in 1974 in cutting the defense and intelligence budgets and the public information budgets, um, stood by as Vietnam fell. We were just, I think we'll discuss that next. But uh, the crisis of the detente policy, which had grown out of our being bogged down in Vietnam, and, and the crisis in dealing with the, at sometimes what were called salami tactics, where they might be active measures, which is intelligence, covert deceptions, and so on, or things, trends like Eurocommunism in Italy, in Finland, and other places where the communists pretended or said they were for peaceful transitions and for mo multiple parties and coalition governments, which would have been very anti or non-communist switches. That pleased a lot of people, and they, they went for it. So that's where detente made sense as a high, I think, high risk, but logically valid gamble. And uh, if we move on to Vietnam, we, I, can, I can tell you how the dominoes started falling after, after the president fell and Vietnam fell. Well, last question. Uh, we've barely spoken about Vietnam, and yet it was a pervasive issue throughout the Nixon presidency. 
So final question to kind of wrap up and tie together some of the issues we- Oh no, we have to go to China too. Well, you can okay, leave China in with your answer. Um, let's you'll let you wrap yeah. it up here, one tidy answer. Oh, okay. um, so we've been talking a lot about detente and the forces that were, were moving before Nixon, during the Nixon administration, but you also write in your book about four Nixon crises, which I thought was interesting. And you say the four Nixon crises were the Pentagon Papers, Watergate, impeachment and Nixon's resignation ultimately. So tie together the discussion we've been having and the relationship that uh, detente ultimately had on these four crises. What was the relationship between these two? Because ultimately what we're talking about is the, the end of the Nixon presidency. And then we'll take some questions from the audience. Okay, real quickly. The Pentagon Papers were a study. I personally participated in, in, in Mr. McNamara's office for half a year before I was assigned to the National Security Council. It was withheld from Lyndon Johnson. I knew, knowing about the study in the NSC and working on Vietnam, wanted the president and his security advisor, Walt Rostow, to see it. Pentagon denied it, the people who had that study. It was, that was denied to President Nixon when he came in in 69, and I went to General Haig and to uh, others and it was requested again and they denied it. A year or two later, two years later, Dan Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers from his office at Rand in Santa Monica. Why hadn't it been given to even the Secretary of Defense? It wasn't. Mr. McNamara had resigned, Mr. Clifford didn't get it. It was sent to him, but Nick, Mr. Nixon came in. So A, it was denied twice to the president. It was given to the New York Times. Secondly, the last bits of data were from mid-1968, so it still was suffered under the impression and the effect of the Tet Offensive, which had kind of demolished um, Vietnam. And it didn't take account of any of the so-called Vietnamization improvements, political, economic, military, Different, very different military tactics uh, that Mr. Rick, uh, Mr. Nixon didn't initiate but implemented very forcefully. I was in Vietnam nine times in that period, uh, usually six times with General Haig, who was his military assistant and then his deputy, and later on became Secretary of State in, in the Reagan period. I could go anywhere in a helicopter, any, I could point at a map and say, I want to go to Pleiku, or I want to go to Vung Tau, or I want to go to I was up in Quezon. I had one man with a pistol who was my interpreter, and I could go anywhere in 73, by 73. We had basically satisfied some re basic requirements, but our troops were gone. We had signed an agreement that, and the Congress had said no more bombing, no more combat. We left no residual force, we left it. We left a lot of refugees, some of them died in trying to escape. When you are engaged in the combat zone and you don't leave a residual force, as we saw in Afghanistan and as we saw in Iraq, there go 58,000 dead in Vietnam. There go 4,000 in Afghanistan. You've got to keep somebody there because the American symbol is important if you are interested in preserving some opportunity for a non-communist path or for, for a non-ISIS path today. You, 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 the, the American absence is a vacuum, and the people who go into the vacuum, that's a major lesson, are usually very hostile to any differences. Why is it that a Shia can murder a, a, a Sunni and claim religious credit for that and heroism and martyrdom? Why can it be the reverse? Why can it be that, a Christ, that the Christians are getting murdered in, the, in all of that area? And sometimes it's necessary to have force against force, to deter with force, to deter with moral principles that you enunciate and mean about human rights instead of just some UN resolution. And look at who's in charge of the UN resolutions and, and human rights in, at the UN. You know, it may be Libya or somebody. Um, so, the hope fell apart as Pentagon Papers turned to checking out 
but beyond intelligence breaking into areas which in this case it was a Democratic Party which had moved left but there were thoughts in Mr. Nixon's and other people's minds let's find out what the Russians are up to who's funding these things these big mo massive mobilizations I remember coming into the White House 200 Greyhound trucks, high windows around the complex of the White House, getting through lines where people were throwing rocks and spitting and calling us all fascists. I was a civil servant. And I had experienced actually fascism or national socialism, knock on your door at night societies and brutalities. And I'd seen already as a child the movies of the Holocaust. Um, and on the other side of the buses were was the 101st Infantry with loaded machine guns and other guns in case the, 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 in case the buses had been climbed over and breached. The White House would have been overrun. I was in the Pentagon on some th occasions when there were also 250,000 people in protesting, including violent rioters, in Washington, D.C. In one of these demonstrations, Mr. Nixon went down to the Lincoln Memorial and talked to People he thought were hippies. They weren't hippies. There were some hippies possibly by then, but still. But it was, they were feeling very firmly against the government. The government hadn't done a very good job of its public diplomacy, of its definitions, and for a while it hadn't done really a good job on, in the military and economic and other lines work it was, should have been doing in Vietnam. I wondered a person like Ed, Ed Lansdale, General Lansdale, who had been a friend of President Zim back in the 60s of Vietnam, and who knew how to talk to people of a different culture and to honor them, respect them. Um, but you know what happened to President Jim, I should have mentioned that in connection with the fall of our policy, the failure of our policy. Jim was the legitimately appointed and then elected president of South Vietnam. And Mr. Kennedy's big, to me, failure in Vietnam was not sending 16,000 Green Berets special forces. He didn't want large combat forces. Almost nobody wanted large combat forces. But he authorized the coup, meaning the assassination of President Diem. And the first time I went to Vietnam, and I was talking to some, he was actually a folk singer, because I always asked to meet the people, the poets or the priests or the, the, the Buddhist, Catholic, labor union leaders and so on. And he said, you know, you Americans, you killed our president, and then your president was killed a month later. That's how they have this judge you. We destroyed a large package of the legitimacy that we had in aiding somebody. When we do that, when we get involved in coups like that, we get in trouble. Okay, so then the president gets caught in the Watergate thing. He covers it up. He had assigned this to some people who were not really officials that could have, might have known what they were doing. The cover cost him the presidency. The presidency goes on August 4th. I happened to be on my honeymoon in Greece with my wife. I saw the newspaper on that day, and I wept about it, and my wife said, what's the matter? And I said, we just lost Vietnam. A lot of friends have died, and others will die, because it just en eroded any deterrence power that we had. And it not, then it cost Cam Cambodia. Five, five million Cambodians were killed out of, out of about 15 or so million. Were killed by the Khmer Rouge. Killed. Uh, Vietnam forced the North Vietnamese to behave quite brutally towards people they held. And then the, at that point, the Chinese with whom we had cut the deals of hope not for peaceful coexistence per se, although that's used in the Shanghai communique that sealed the deal, the handshake, they had, they had indicated because of their fear of the Soviet Union launching a preemptive strike against their nuclear facilities. They were in mortal danger. And they, Mao reached out to us, not, not because we had supported the Red Guards and the revolutions and the Great Leap Forward, but because we might create together ambiguity in the Soviet mind about well, how we would react if the Chinese were hit. That, not the battles, battles on the Assyria River and so on, is what caused the Chinese 
and the Americans, Mr. Nixon, to, to clasp hands without having to acknowledge each other's ideologies of freedom versus tyranny and so on as being equally moral. And when that collapsed, the other things collapsed, and um, the Soviets got more aggressive, had the biggest arms, arms buildup in, in history. We developed about four systems in the 60s, in the se early 70s. Basically, we stopped developing strategic system. The Soviets had 24. And that wasn't, the Carter couldn't halt that and he tried more peaceful coexistence, or his version of detente, which was much weaker than President Nixon's, and it took Reagan to reverse most of those policies and to actually, on human rights, on military strength, peace, through, peace and freedom through strength, was the name of his part, that part of the platform. And we changed the rules of arms control to insist on on-site inspections, undeclared sites. Today, the Iran agreement we have, supposedly, 159 pages hadn't even been signed. You can't verify in undeclared sites. You can't verify in military sites. Well, those are, that's where the bad stuff is going on. When Mr. Um, Mr. Clinton signed an agreement in 1994 with North Korea, he promised there no nuclear development. It was one of the worst agreements we've ever signed. And of course, they violated it. It was easy to violate it. And when the, they did their first test in, 19, in 2006, Mr. Bush did nothing but complain a little bit. And now we've kicked the can down the road so far that it's no longer a can. It's now a missile that's armed with nuclear warheads. We should have learned that lesson some time ago. And uh, I'm very concerned about that. I'm very, very concerned about the Iranian thing and about the collaboration between the Chinese, the Iranians, where do you think a lot of the money that went to Iran went? That's right, to North Korea, along with uh, nuclear technology. The Russians and the Pakistanis, you got five nuclear powers potentially threatening us and very confused situations on human rights throughout the world. And it's, if you don't have human rights and if you don't have liberty and you don't have constitutions, then those groups getting nuclear weapons or just using terror, uh, bioweapons, very easy to use. They're very difficult to store, but they could, or other things. That's the world that we face, and since none of us anymore, well, I'm, as I said, I'm nearly 80, uh, I have memories or knowledge of this, and so every slogan that you hear from a political party, a secretary of, a cabinet secretary, uh, sometimes a president doesn't take into account the experiences of the past and tries themselves with their own energy and their own excellence and goodwill and good intentions to resolve problems with, against criminal minds or nutty minds and powers that, that don't work. You have to have some combination of maybe trying for peace and detente and also being somewhat realistic about the instruments of power, including moral power, and, and what our founding fathers called divine providence, which is an important power. Um, they were stirred through various crises with divine providence sometimes. If it isn't, it seems beyond human <laughs> capability. Well, you, you use the phrase lessons from history, and I think in some way this book could be just as easily titled that. I, I feel like I've gone back to college tonight <laughs> in, a good, in a good way. <laughs> Thank you. And one, one thing we didn't get to discuss that maybe will come out in the Q&A is I do want to hear, and I think the audience would enjoy hearing, any insights you have on President Nixon and his legacy as well. Um, but maybe that'll come out in the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Sven. Uh, Luke, um, just wanted to remind everyone that Inside the Cold War is available for purchase in the museum store, so I, um, you can order it at the museum store, and Sven will sign uh, books for you. Um, our first question comes from our Facebook audience. Uh, Doug Lawson asks, how, is today's, how are the goals of today's Russia differ from that of the Soviet Union? Um, how is today's Russia different from the Soviet Union? It, is, it has no ideology, but it has power seekers, and the old 
Soviet monopolies. In this communist state, it, you have a monopoly. I mean, people who are anti-capitalist because it's monopoly, big business, or military industrial complex should go to Russia, should have gone to the Soviet Union, should go to China, where it's all one big party-administered things. The party is an elite, and it's privileged, and it gets privileges. It has its own hospitals, its own um, uh, vacation places. If you've been in Sochi, as I have in the South, it's that's, that yet was party headquarters. Today, the oligarchs are former KGB Russian allies of Mr. Putin. He himself is an oligarch. He's probably the wealthiest man in Russia. So the natural resources that were nationalized and denationalized by Yeltsin in the 90s have been re, uh, re, re combined as cartels run by buddies. And they, they they get around the laws, they make the law. The parliament doesn't say no, the parliament doesn't have hearings, the parliament doesn't hear budget plans. It's a still, still a central planning effort. It's not ghost plan anymore, but it's, it's a few guys that decide how, how to drill and, and sell and construct. And the intelligence operations of the Soviet regime have been exceeded by the number in the Putin regime, in this country, for example, extremely active, and that, continu that continues with active measures, deceptions, and front groups. In the Vietnam period, there were quite a few front groups, uh, some known, some more carefully hidden, which is what I think led to the Watergate, contributed to the Watergate fear of a, a whole party perhaps having been taken over. Now, if you're talking about, and I just, this was not asked, but the collusion issue, there's lots of, anybody who does a lot of business with Russia uh, and places reliance on them or vice versa is in trouble. And for example, this is a generally taboo subject, but the, the sale of the atomic, 20% of the atomic, uh, ores and production in the United States were sold to a Canadian company that had been um, bought by the Russians. So they now own 20%. That was approved by a Secretary of State named Hillary Clinton. And her foundation got $140 million from some Russians immediately. That's collusion in my view. Or if you leave your, your, if you leave your computers um, in the case of the Democratic National Committee, the password for Mr. Podesta was password. You know, and Hillary's computers had all kinds of stuff. So somebody is being, not being careful enough in answering this question that was asked about the new Soviet Union uh, and the new Russia. There are some similarities and they will exploit they can't do it on humanitarian grounds. They can't do it philosophically. They can't even do it culturally anymore. In Russian Soviet culture was pretty advanced in some respects. That's all gone. So I'm, I'm worried about Russia, but I put it in the circle of other nuclear and um, determined powers, expansive powers. Pakistan has said, there have been Pakistanis who have said the, um, the Pakistani atomic weapons are Islamic bomb. That's what ISIS has said, destroy a country they don't even want on a map named Israel. There are things like that going on. A question in the back row. Uh, Dr. Kramer, uh, how do you see the current Korean situation playing out? And specifically, how do you see the United States engaging China to get them involved in this process? First of all, I'm not a doctor. I went to Berkeley, took my exams. I was, took them right at the same months as the free speech movement so-called was active and that split the committees, the departments, and I had a divided committee on my doctoral exams. And in international affairs and in political philosophy, which I'd been teaching assistant in, that was a problem. Uh, no, there, it, there was a problem in American, American government and in international affairs. And one of the two professors who didn't like what, who I was had said, well, hey, you worked in the Pentagon. You don't want people to work in the Pentagon. And the other one had said that I had, among other things, said that sometimes 47 people were in, 
teaching assistants were on strike and I wasn't. I was discussing the issues of the strike and rejecting the violence. Um, but Korea, I place almost all the responsibility on China. And when I talk to Chinese, I say, if you don't sit on the neck of your little brothers with whom you did fight the Korean War, and they owe you that, uh, and you start to complain about refugees coming across your borders if something goes haywire in terms of the economy or something else in North Korea, then you better think about what happens if there is a nuclear weapon mistake vis-a-vis -vis Japan, which will go nuclear. They can do it fast nuclear proliferation. South Korea can go nuclear. Are you in favor of that kind of development by your lassitude towards your little brother, whom they can cut off, they could supply the energy, they supply the food, they supply the money, the banking, and we, the United States, have ignored that too long. Russia also helps. Pakistan also helps. Iran is a close partner of North Korea. We cut a deal with Iran which left a lot of room for continued action by North Korea, uh, between North Korea and Iran. So you kick the, the can down the road so far and you can't kick it anymore because the next time you kick it, it's a bomb. You kicked it, you're kicking an IED. You know, it's very dangerous. It's the most dangerous thing I've seen for a long time. But I also think that if we had a, and some of what Mr. Trump says is, is in the right track, he actually, is trying to get the Chinese to do things they have resisted doing, and he's actually trying to wake up, if not the leader, at least his senior circle, to the fact that there is quite a bit of power that we have, and there may be sources of power and military action that, that you and I don't know about. I don't have access to anything classified at this time. I haven't for some years. Who knows what can be done? But the, the bit, my, my big hope is that somehow China, China will wake up to its responsibility as much as to its danger, and that Russia will too. Russia is in, in, a, in danger too, and we are. That's, why don't we have anti-missile defenses? What is this? Mr. Clinton cut, eliminated any national missile defense program that Bush and, and Yeltsin had agreed on, GPALS, Global uh, Prevention of Limited Attack or something. And we're just starting to catch up with intermediate range missile, anti-ballistic um, missile defenses. So we're vulnerable. That's a self-inflicted wound. That relates to the folly of saying that the ban on anti-ballistic missile defenses is an assault on the strategic, the center of strategic stability. That was a sentence used by the Clinton and Obama administration about anybody like me who said we need missile defenses if deterrence fails. Now, now we have impos almost impossible moral choices, moral choices, in addition to the strategic ones. A question right here. Hi, thank you so much for coming. I, I really enjoyed your speech, but I have a question. You keep talking about learning from history and you've got a captive audience. I'm sorry. Run, uh, you have a captive audience of young people yes. that could learn from history. And my question to you is what one experience, given your vast experience, what one thing could you pass to the future generations that you learned from that maybe they could take with them as they leave? Well, thank you so much. The, the reason I'm, probably the reason I'm still alive <laughs> is that I'm concerned about securing the blessings, providing for the common defense and securing the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, okay? So I have two sons, but I have, I worry about the younger generation all the time. They don't know history, most of them don't wanna know any history. The interns that I still meet with, I don't meet with people of my age, because they're all broken down. <laughs> or, or, or they turn from pessimism to cynicism, and I can't stand cynicism, I, because I do believe in divine providence. And there's always a saving remnant, there's always a possibility of, you know, that's a theological term, you don't destroy the world because there's 10 people, give me 10 men, and so on. It's a deal between Abraham and, and God. Um, but you have to do your homework on issues that you're interested in. Don't think you understand Korea or Iran or, or 
taxation or whatever it is, and then find the calling. What are the callings? What are you being called to do? Get engaged, find mentors, find some, uh, some politician, one politician that you respect. Work, go, try to go to work for them, write and work in their campaign. But you have to do your homework on what is the issue, what are the options. And I say to people, don't be an academic who does incredible an analyses and dissections, the words are related, the analysis is a dissection, construct some options, make some recommendations. Don't be a lawyer who only analyzes and dissects. Be one who makes a recommendation to your client. Your client is a senator, your client is the Assistant Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the President of the United States, the, the editorial board of your newspaper that's saying ridiculous slogans so that you have the confidence of the facts, including the dilemmas, the choices. I want to say about Mr. Nixon, about every president I've worked for up close, that those are impossible jobs for, I, I mean, I would be crushed in, in four days, in one week, by the workload, by the intensity. There's no problem that comes to the White House. They're all dilemmas. They're all dilemmas. There's no, there's no easy, vote in the Senate or for a cabinet member. Um, so you have to come up with a recommendation based on options that are in turn based on different costs, consequences, unknowns, um, unintended consequences, costs, different costs, fiscal costs, and so on. And you have to have an integrated strategy for that. That's, that should be an objective. But if you only want to teach fourth grade in a ghetto school, or you only want to be, or you want to be in an emergency ward in a hospital, or you want to do the kind of thing I did at different times. No, uh, the, you have to be willing to suffer and to endure things that you can't solve, but you can maybe help out even in the short term in alleviating pain. I just want to tell you that the word. Some people have said to me, a very mild-mannered person, that I'm very passionate. And I say, you know what passion means? It comes from the Latin word passos. It means pain. Compassionate is to feel the pain of somebody else because you have felt it. The passion of Christ is not the joy and enthusiasm of Christ. It's the suffering of and the consequences that it brought to him and to, to his uh, followers. Um, so learn, if it's a flood victim, learn not to come up with some slogan and hope we can reconstruct. I mean, engage. Do it in your, in your church, your temple, wherever you are at in your school. Don't ever become cynical and don't ever give up hope. It is surprising to me, my, the interns that I talk to in different institutions in Washington, D.C., which is a fairly pessimistic, pessimistic and even cynical city, how, not in the group, they won't admit that they have any of those concerns or issues, but they seem at a private level, they come up afterwards and ask the question, especially say, what, how do I hear the call? What call, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by mentor? What do you mean by passion? It helps. That's what young people need because they aren't getting it from their parents, they aren't getting it from the newspapers, they aren't getting it from their TV, and they're certainly not getting it from the little electric gadgets that entertain and ruin the mind and ruin the heart. Use the eyes, that you, you have to use the eyes of your heart, not just your brains, and go beyond entertainment. Now politics, our politics are now entertainment. The news media drive me crazy and uh, much of our politics is too. Yes, Jonathan. <laughs> We have a question in the back row. Oh, uh, hi there. Um, thanks for an informative uh, lecture. Uh, speaking of young people, uh, I'm 25, and virtually everyone I know that's my age identifies as a uh, socialist, and I know that they don't have much of a context for that. And one thing that's always uh, baffled me is why socialism has got more of a pass over the years. We all seem to have some kind of a loose conception of what it means to be a Nazi. But uh, if you look over even uh, post-World War II with uh, Cambodia, uh, Pol Pot, and domestically with the Weather Underground and the, the Red Brigade, uh, Marxism has taken a grip 
on a lot of uh, young people and in academia. And what, in, in your view, why do you think that's gotten more of a pass over the years? It gets a pass because of the name. And when people hear socialism, they think of a benign society, social, being social, bull. And they also think that socialism is democratic. And it, it has very strong and valuable democratic forms. Uh, in, in Scandinavia, for example, in Germany, you can be a benign democratic person with a with strong heart and be a socialist. The difficulty is in solving the problem that socialism, not to mention communism, which is always the violent totalitarian form of socialism, um, whether it's Nazi or, or Soviet, uh, is that it creates a bureaucracy. It emphasizes the bureaucracy. It emphasizes the central government. It emphasizes Paris and Berlin and London and Washington, D.C. And that is why, I, I, that's how I explain the revolt of uh, the 2016 elections and the split between rural and, and urban. Because the country, if you look at the map, the, except for the left coast or the west coast and, the, and New England, and uh, um, I think it was Arizona and New Mexico, or uh, no, Arizona and Colorado. It's all, it was all, it's Trump country. That is the forgotten man speaking, as he called him, speaking against the bureaucracy. And if socialism implies, as it does to me, in its consequences, even in its ben most benign form, central government of a stronger kind, in the crushing of individuality and of individual views, for example, now on the academic campuses is worse than ever. You cannot be a heretic to the politically correct dominant view without suffering probably social consequences, sometimes academic consequences and sometimes physical consequences. That's a, that's a bad, that's, but that's an example of what I'm saying is if, if you just think you're being on the left, for example, which is where most socialists put themselves, that that's benign and friendly and it means you're really progressive. It's reactionary to want, in my view, to, to want central government in Washington, D.C., which isn't even in the center of the country, to administer things. I believe my experience in the government was that the interagency system, the system that is coordinated in the defense and foreign policy area in the National Security Council, broke down in the, probably at the end of the Reagan period, maybe somewhere through the first Bush period. It was broken in the Clinton period. It was very definitely broken in the Obama period. And the Congress has been, by and large, broken from having resilient, formidable action to solve problems, to even lay out the options. They're either or, they're binary. You're either a friend or you're a foe. That incidentally is Marxist's, Marxist's dialectic when he turned Mr. Hegel upside down. Hegel said we have a thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, which takes the best of the, of the two and casts out the worst. Marx changed it to binary. You're either with us or you're against us. The two classes, they, one kills the other, they don't merge. And in the bureaucracy, which is eating up a lot of money, procrastinating on every issue. They set up a new con con commission. They don't talk to each other because they're each protecting their turf and they're spending money and the budgets are guaranteed. And who checks on it? The larger it gets. When I last worked in the office of Secretary of Defense, we had 5,000 people in the office of the Secretary of Defense in a building that had 30,000 people in it. Do you think they accomplish very much other than going to meetings? My, I had a classified computer, maybe 60 um, emails a day. Read tab E. That's a change in the, for the meeting at 11 o'clock. Then I had about 30 unclassified. Can any human being read those? And when you go to a meeting, do you think everybody's read it? And the, other than the sentences that affect their turf? No. When can you meditate? When can you think? When can you have a discourse? So that's a long answer, but people have to know what 
I, I'm in favor of delegating to the states. I'm in favor of delegating to localities. I mean, I'm in favor of anything that promotes that and by instinct, except in the area of national defense and some, uh, some other issues that require real, I mean, you have to have some national policies, for example, on transportation or communications, networks and safety rules and stuff like that, and, and some other help. But I would be in favor of not of, of delegating as much of that possible down and not have the central state, which can become a very politically correct, expensive machine that alienates, should, should be alienating everybody, and they, why everybody, so many people tolerate it is they're worn out. Thank you, Sven. Thank you, Luke. Please give both gentlemen a round of applause. Inside the Cold War, from Marx to Reagan, is again available in the museum store for purchase, and uh, Mr. Kramer will sign them after uh, in the lobby. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.